I'm Dr. Susan Madsen. I'm a professor of organizational leadership in the Woodbury School of Business here at Utah Valley University. And I founded the Utah Women in Leadership Project and been working on efforts to strengthen the, uh, the impact of Utah girls and women um, through getting them to go to college and graduate and uh, aspiring more to use their voices and have confidence to really become leaders. We need more women as leaders. We need men and women to work together um, in the homes and communities and PTAs and legislature and all of those kinds of things. So a few more quick slides, just giving a little bit of the data, and Jane, Jane is gonna share some as well, um, on, from one of our briefs on uh, Utah women and depression. First, the state regularly reports rates higher than the national average for depression. One recent study ranked Utah at the worst of all 50 states, plus DC when it comes to the percentage of adults with mental illness and their access to affordable care, among other things. The 2016 Utah State Health Assessment reported that Utah women suffer from poor mental health at a much higher rate than men do. You can see the percentage there. Utah women have 4.2 days per month of poor mental health compared to Utah men, you can see that number there, 2.7. And then nearly a quarter of all women ages 18 through uh, 34 report seven or more poor health, uh, mental health days per month. About 15% of Utah women report frequent uh, postpartum depression symptoms, which is higher than the nation. Um, in 2012 to 2014, Utah had the fourth highest female suicide rate. Um, and the last one, I'm not trying to all depress you, but, <laughs> but it's good for us to know these numbers, it really is. Um, about 29% of Utah women with less than a high school. You know, those of you that know me, I'm about women going to college and graduating. So look at the differences in percentages of mental health between those who have graduated from college and those who haven't even finished high school. Well, that's a little bit of background. I'm excited to, now to be able to introduce you to um, Jane. Jane Clayson Johnson is an award-winning journalist, widely known for her work at CBS News, ABC News, and on the national syndicated NPR program, On Point. Over more than two decades, she traveled the world covering the biggest news of the day. As a correspondent at ABC News, she reported on many international stories from the NATO airstrikes in Kosovo and the refugee crisis in uh, Macedonia, to the fall of Suharto government in Jakarta, Indonesia. At CBS, she hosted the early show with Bryant Gumbel and was on air on 9-11, subsequently covering the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center in New York and the Pentagon in Washington, DC. In addition to interviewing world leaders, authors, thinkers, and scientists, Jane has had a front row seat to American culture, interviewing stars from Hollywood and Broadway. Jane famously interviewed a reluctant Martha Stewart while she was chopping cabbage just before Martha went to prison. <laughs> Jane has won numerous uh, journalism awards, including an Emmy and the prestigious Edward R. Murrow Award. She is a best-selling author of I Am Mother, which chronicled her decision to leave the world of network television to start a family. She now guest hosts the two-hour nationally syndicated NPR program On Point. Jane was actually born in Salt Lake City, but grew up living all over the country while her father trained as a vascular surgeon. She came back to Utah to attend Brigham Young University on a violin performance scholarship. I didn't know that. Um, and then began her career at KSL TV in Salt Lake City. Jane now lives in Boston with her husband and two teenage children. Jane also has three older stepchildren and three grandbabies. We're so glad you have decided to come back to Utah to, to be able to speak tonight and talk about your important new book, Silent Souls Weeping. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Susan. I really appreciate it. Um, Utah's not my home, but every time I come back to Utah, I feel like I'm coming home. Maybe because I worked for so many years here, I have so many friends here, um, and it's great to be back, even if only for about 36 hours. Um, I flew in last night, late last night from Boston, and the first thing I wanted to do this morning was look at those beautiful mountains. They're just, there's just nothing like them. Uh, they fill my soul, they're so beautiful. Um, it's great to be with you here tonight. I'm grateful for Susan and her team and the work that they do here at Utah Valley, uh, the important work on leadership and helping women find their voices. Um, it's really important and I'm, I'm grateful. We've been trying to schedule this for about a year or so, so I really appreciate uh, the invitation to speak on this important topic. There's a lot of power in a room like this, um, in a gathering like this. I love to see women come together and unify, um, so I, I really appreciate you coming tonight, making the time. I'm glad for the few men that have uh, showed up, and I know that there are a few uh, young people here, young men and young women especially. Your voices on the topic of depression are gonna be crucial as we change the narrative about mental health in the years to come, so I really appreciate you coming. Thank you very much. So I'd like to begin tonight by asking you to stand if you or someone you know suffers or has suffered with depression. <laughs> I'm standing with you. Thank you very much. I think it's really important um, to see how this issue touches so many lives. A couple of years ago, I was attending an Easter program in New Hampshire with my daughter. During intermission, I ran into an old friend whom I've always admired for her candor and authenticity. We were chatting, catching up on our busy lives and growing families, and at one point she asked me, so what's new with you? What are you up to these days? I said, well, I'm writing another book. And then I just spit it out without thinking about depression. Her eyes widened in surprise. Really? I could see the wheels turning in her mind. And then she leaned in. You don't have depression, do you? When I started this project, I wasn't so direct. I worried that someone would ask that very question. To be honest, I grew up with the notion that mental illness was not something to be discussed ever. This is not a book I expected to write. My own journey through depression was unexpected and harrowing, but I chose to write about it and share it in a very honest way. It wasn't easy. I felt very vulnerable at times, I still do. But I knew that I had to be more open about my own struggles if I was going to invite others to become more open about theirs. And I can tell you honestly, it has been life-changing. For three years, I put my journalism skills to use. I interviewed more than 150 men, women, teenagers, and children, all who've suffered with depression, anxiety, or other mental illnesses, and so often in silence. I heard many times, I've never talked about this with anyone, or my parents don't know this, or I can't believe I'm telling you this. Some women I had just met brought me their journals to read. At one point, people I didn't know started reaching out to me to share their stories. They had heard about my project from somebody else I had interviewed, and they wanted to contribute. What struck me most through all of this is that people wanted to be heard. They wanted difficult experiences to be validated, and they desperately wished to help others who suffer. The stories I heard were heartbreaking in their honesty, but also tremendously inspiring and redemptive. In every person I interviewed, I heard pain and loneliness and vulnerability, but I also heard love and hope and life. Through the power of these stories is a plea to change our dialogue, to raise the blinds on the windows of a darkened room, to open a new level of honesty and authenticity, surrounding mental health. The worst part of depression 
is the profound isolation it engenders from family, friends, and community. Sharing our stories is the first step toward ending that isolation. Tonight, I will focus on the stigma associated with depression and mental illness, toxic perfectionism as a contributor to depression, the epidemic of suicide, and I will end with some personal thoughts about what compelled me to begin this journey in the first place. Depression has hitched a ride with the human family since the very beginning. Millions have done battle with it. Productive, high-performing people, past and present. And some of the greats, Lincoln, Churchill, Beethoven, Tolstoy, Emily Dickinson, Mother Teresa, and the list goes on and on. So those of us who suffer with depression are in good company. The World Health Organization estimates that more than 350 million people worldwide experience an episode of clinical depression every year, but fewer than half of them seek help. In this country, the National Institute of Mental Health estimates that more than 16 million American adults suffered at least one major depressive episode in the past year. That's about 7% of the population just in the past year. Of course, many men suffer, but women tend to be generally at higher risk at experiencing depression at almost double the rate of men. And depending on the study, 15 to 20 percent of women who give birth every year have postpartum depression, which is another talk entirely and such an important issue. When U.S. public health researchers ranked the leading causes of disability and early death for adults in this country, Depression was number five on the list, just below heart disease and lung cancer, but above stroke, diabetes, car accidents, and other cancers. Broadly speaking, depression is best thought of on a continuum. We are not meant to be happy all the time, of course. Most people experience normal fluctuations of emotion. It's the intensity and the duration of negative moods in a depressed person that is excessive. Depression is an overwhelming feeling of despair and unworthiness that takes over your mind, body, and spirit. And it can be difficult to articulate or describe exactly what that feels like, which is why so often in my interviews, people resorted to words like drowning, choking, sinking, suffocating. One teenager told me it was like being in mandated solitary confinement. I related to this description I heard. Every move was slow. Every word I said was slow. It was this all-consuming darkness that just felt like there was no hope for anything ever. I can't describe it because it was so horrible, and even in my imagination, I can't make myself feel that way again. Symptoms of depression vary, of course. Some people don't cry or even act terribly sad when they're depressed. Rather, they're emotionally blank or numb. They feel worthless or hopeless. Still others present with anger or rage. One psychiatrist told me, depression is a ball and chain. Some people drag it, other people swing it. Let me play three short video clips for you here. I asked some of the people that I interviewed for my book to uh, make an appearance throughout my talk today. No fancy production values, just wonderfully open and honest people. I call them my team of stigma busters. Here they are first uh, describing how depression felt to them. When I was in depression, it just felt like drudgery, like life was just horrible. And I was just so dark and sad and upset and lonely and in pain, mental pain, physical pain. You know, I just, I felt like I was in a black pit, like in a dark fog. People see depression sometimes as a hopelessness, uh, a worthlessness. The real reality of this disease in my mind is the mind and body are sick and it hurts. It is painful. 
there are so many parts that are hard, but one of the worst things is just feeling like you're not yourself anymore and that you might not ever be yourself again, that it's just not possible. I love those descriptions. I also heard a range of emotions that often accompany depression. Confusion, I've got a great life, why do I feel so badly? Denial, if only my spouse or kids could just do things differently, I would be fine. Pride, other folks can go see a psychiatrist or a counselor, but I can lick this myself. Shame, I am so weak and embarrassment. Please don't tell anyone I am struggling or my spouse is struggling or my children are struggling. It's those last two quotes that I'd like to focus on first. Virtually every person I interviewed for Silent Souls Weeping reported experiencing issues of stigma. It was a common thread running through every conversation, this sense of embarrassment or even shame attached not only to a mental health diagnosis, but to the medication prescribed and the therapy required for treatment. This recent op-ed in the Salt Lake Tribune correctly states, mental health specialists and organizations have made significant efforts in recent years, but the progress is slow and stigma continues to be the leading reason that individuals and families do not reach out for help, even in times of crisis. Here are some descriptions of that stigma, various experiences I heard again from the wonderful people that I interviewed. When I took my daughter to the hospital, uh, when she was suffering with depression, I felt really alone. And that was a time probably more than any that I really needed help and support, but I didn't want other people to think that we were crazy. Um, so I didn't say anything to people and just suffered in silence, kept it to ourselves. It was really hard. Certainly our son, when he is at his lower times, I would say is ashamed. Um, and a lot of the shame, sadly, is not necessarily because he is a person with depression. It's that because he has depression, he's been unable to complete a semester of school. He's completely out of step with his peers, educationally, uh, employment-wise, and socially. And so the shame is, the by, uh, is, is because of the byproducts, not necessarily because of the disease itself. For a long time, I didn't really talk about my depression because I felt embarrassed. I felt shameful, like I had done something wrong to cause this. And I think also I felt like if I admitted it or said it out loud, it would be too real, like too much of a reality and it would be permanent and I would be judged and I was just scared. Embarrassment, fear, Shame. Our historical misconceptions have led us to a very judgmental view of depression. But whether the stigma is self-induced or culturally imposed, it is unhealthy and unhelpful. Part of the problem is that depression has for so long been perceived as a character flaw, something that we can control or overcome if we just tried harder. The cultural context of many religions, for example, leads some people to believe that if you just pray harder, depression will go away. To which many relig religious leaders I spoke with replied with this question, would you sit in the corner and pray your heart disease away? No, you would pray and you would go to the cardiologist. The same principle applies to depression. As an organ of the body, the brain can fall ill in the same way that the heart or the kidney can. Just like any other physical condition, depression requires treatment. One woman told me she wished she could wear a cast on her head because something is broken in there, she said, and that's really hard for people to understand. One of the many physicians I interviewed said this, just as type 1 diabetes is caused by inadequate insulin production in the pancreas, mental illnesses such as depression and anxiety often involve chemical disorders or abnormalities in the brain. 
You can see it clearly on this PET scan. The brain activity of, of a clinically depressed person on the left there looks very different from that healthy brain on the right. A depressed brain is quite literally dark. This kind of understanding provides important perspective for the young woman in that video clip who worried that she'd done something to cause her depression and that she'd be judged for it. Can you imagine if we got blamed for having cancer? Or if we blamed ourselves for cancer? This public service campaign uh, is produced by a group called Bring Change to Mind. They are a terrific resource and they do excellent work to end the stigma associated with mental illness. The billboard reminds me of a story uh, that a woman told me about her two sisters. The first sister had struggled with mental illness her whole life, and recently she'd been hospitalized for major depression and suicidal ideation. The second sister had been diagnosed with an advanced cancer. These two sisters were in different hospitals at exactly the same time, each fighting for their lives, each with a potentially terminal illness. But the reaction of family and friends to these two women was so vastly different. Here's how the sibling described it to me, quote, for the sister with cancer, there was an outpouring of love and kindness, an online fundraiser to pay for expenses, Meals, support, so much love, and she so richly deserved it. It's just an awful situation. But for the sister with clinical depression and suicidal ideation, nothing even close to that. No cards or casseroles, just, oh, there she goes again. She's back in the hospital. Even from people who love her, there is frustration and judgment that my sister with cancer just, not, just does not have, end quote. Now listen to how the sister with depression described it herself. I so wish I could be in her shoes, the sister with cancer. I would take the death that is coming her way. It would be such a relief to be able to die in a non-embarrassing way, to have my own troubles come to an end in a way that people wouldn't judge me. And they'd reach out to my kids and be kind and loving to them and take care of them, end quote. In no way do I mean to diminish the suffering of anyone. However, it is important to recognize that just like any other physical illness, clinical depression requires treatment. It is not the result of personal inadequacy. It is not a black mark on your character. Nobody thinks that battling cancer or diabetes or heart disease or any other serious illness is a matter of pulling up your bootstraps and going at it alone. If you are clinically depressed, you are not just gonna snap out of it and fix it with work and discipline. Unfortunately, too many people still believe otherwise. Lori was among them. Years ago, as a student here in Utah County, she finally decided to pay a visit to, to the campus health center. Her symptoms? No matter how much she slept, she was still exhausted, and there were days she couldn't get out of bed at all. She struggled to concentrate. She was irritable, short-tempered. Most alarmingly, she was having chest pain, shortness of breath, hot flashes, and other symptoms physical symptoms of panic. To her deep embarrassment and dismay, Lori was diagnosed with depression and anxiety. The doctor laid out a comprehensive treatment plan and gave her some medication. But as soon as Lori got back to her apartment, she flushed those pills down the toilet. I was embarrassed, she told me these many years later. I felt like this was a weakness that I could will myself out of, that I should be able to fix it myself, end quote. Lori had many difficult years after that. She graduated, met and married her husband, gave birth to two children, all without ever telling anyone about her diagnosis or the symptoms she continued to experience. She hid them in shame, rejoicing during periods of normalcy and suffering in silence when they roared back like a raging river. It wasn't until her third child was born that Lori finally had the courage to talk to her doctor. She started a treatment plan of cognitive behavioral therapy and found a medication that worked for her. 
Within a few weeks, she started to feel better. Lori's story is not uncommon, but today, Lori speaks openly and honestly about her journey with depression. And because she's, she does, she's inspired many people to get help. Here she is, full of personality and passion and wisdom. I joke when I speak sometimes that I'm the happiest depressed person you will ever meet because I have been able to access medication, therapy, cognitive um, behaviors that have all helped me and to cope with something that I think is just part of my life's journey. I so love Lori. And I appreciate that she has brought to her battle with depression many weapons, not just medication and talk therapy, but a healthy diet, regular exercise, good sleep. And part of her self-care, an important part, she says, is speaking honestly about her struggle and how she manages it. Lori has learned this important point. Silence strengthens stigma and shame. Stigma and shame lead to isolation and more silence, which aggravate depression and cut off important sources of support and treatment. I appreciated another woman like Lori who told me, for over a decade I suffered in silence. I was sure I could cure my depression through sheer force of will. I wish I could have those 10 years back with needed treatment. So how do we open up? Start these difficult or uncomfortable conversations, admit it in ourselves, and encourage others to get help. One thing I've discovered that's been very effective is to simply rephrase the issue. I talk very practically about brain health rather than mental health. I talk about the brain as just another organ of the body. Just like we welcome discussions about heart health, well, brain health is critically important too. I found that that removes some of the stigma. But more often than not, we simply have to dive right into our stories, right into our stories, without thinking too much about it. Every person I interviewed for this book, the ones you'll see here tonight and the many that you won't, said that talking about their depression helped. It helped them, and it helped those around them. Here again, my stigma busters, with three good examples of how that happened. The place where I feel like our openness has led to any kind of help to anyone else is those who are suffering or have a family member they're suffering, and we're doing it alone and quietly. And this then gives them license to call and say, me too. And then we can share ideas about treatment and about uh, how to maintain hope and be happy during these kinds of duress. What the science is understanding about depression and anxiety is that what most people do is they hide from it. They don't want to deal with it. Um, but what we understand helps with healing is going towards it, trying to understand it. The more we learn to name it, and they say name it to tame it, and to open up about it, and try to understand it as an individual and try to force ourselves to communicate with others who love us so they can understand it, the more possibility of healing. I was surprised at how often when I spoke about depression, other women connected with me and said, hey, I'm going through this too. And I didn't know that I wasn't alone. And I feel like we just need to strengthen that sisterhood and let, let other women know that, yeah, you're not alone. We are all working hard through this together. We are all working through this together. It has been documented over and over again. The most effective method to bring empathy and understanding is to tell and retell our stories. Storytelling is the most effective way of reducing stigma, and that's powerful and telling your story while being witnessed with loving attention by others who care may be the most powerful medicine on earth. I got an email uh, just yesterday 
from a woman who shared with me how she had reached out to a 14-year-old girl she knew was struggling with depression, a girl who wouldn't go to school, um, would barely leave her dark room. This woman had the courage to share her own experience with depression as uh, a teenager. It started in seventh grade and culminated in eighth grade when her mother came home from work to find her huddled under the bed, making a concrete plan to end her life. Sharing that story, hearing how she was able to get help after that dark and desperate moment, seeing that this woman is happy, a happy functioning adult now, really helped this 14-year-old girl recognize and realize that she is not alone, that others have been through this, that they can make it through. It was a connection that was made, and it was an important source of healing. Healing is a process, not an event. Treatment for depression often requires a multifaceted approach, lots of trial and error. And what works for one person may not necessarily work for another. But treatment works. And starting the conversation opens a pathway toward help and hope and knocks out the stigma along the way. I also believe that it's a mistake and potentially damaging to hide our own mental health challenges from our kids. Because here's the truth, 20% of teenagers will experience depression before adulthood, that's one in five. And so what's the message we're sending to our kids if we don't wanna talk about it? How will they ever, ever feel comfortable disclosing their challenges and getting the help that they need? When will the cycle of silence and shame ever end? My children were actually my greatest motivation for writing my book. My dedication page reads, so my children will understand. So my hope today is that we will strip depression of superstition, mythology, and these moral judgments. Get the stories flowing in families, in neighborhoods, classrooms, and churches, and encourage those who are suffering to get help. There is hope. So besides stigma, another dominant theme in my interviews was toxic perfectionism as a contributor to depression. I am a recovering perfectionist myself, so it was not a surprise to me that so many women, especially that I spoke with, repeatedly mentioned the appearance of their homes or their children, or how they looked, or what others thought of them. I totally get it. There was a time in my life when I was very careful not to let anyone into my house unless it was perfectly clean. If we had people coming over for dinner, I would have my husband carry our piles of stuff upstairs to the bedroom so that the family room and kitchen looked perfectly spotless. When the guests arrived, we'd have our time, and when the guests left, we'd haul everything back downstairs to live again. I had somehow convinced myself that a perfectly clean house was a reflection of my worth as a person, of my mothering skills, my homemaking skills, my time management skills, whatever. These days, I proudly proclaim to our guests, you get to see us as we are, and that feels really good. Life is messy literally and figuratively. And when we are working so hard to live up to some unattainable standard of perfection, we're just not authentic. Social media fuels this with carefully filtered and curated feeds to show the happiest, prettiest, and shiniest events in all of our lives. This desire to hide every flaw in appearance, in academics, in business, in parenting, lesson planning, fitness, in every area of life, to present a put together successful exterior, it is detrimental to good mental health. Let me tell you the story of this box. There's an inside too. It has a powerful lesson in our family about toxic perfectionism. 
Not long ago, one of our children participated in an art therapy program for anxiety. And uh, I have to tell you, it was as much an education for me as it was for our child. On this particular day, a fresh-faced young psychologist showed up to run the class. She rolled out a stack of boxes, a huge pile of magazines, and some scissors and tape. Our assignment was to create a piece of art she called our authenticity box. On the outside of the box, we were supposed to tape all sorts of pictures and word descriptions about who we are, how we present ourselves to other people, and how we want others to view us. This was our image. On the inside of the box, we taped pictures and word descriptions that depict who we really are. Behind closed doors, when nobody else is around. After about an hour of cutting and taping and talking, we clearly understood the psychologist's lesson. The more alike the outside and inside of your box, the healthier your mental state. So here's our box. There's a lot of good. This is a few years old now. It's kind of coming undone. There's a lot inside. There's depression, what are others saying? Can I learn to stop worrying, among other things? To be truthful, I think our box would look very different today than it did back then. So we keep this in the family room now as a very visual reminder of everything that is wrong with perfectionism. I have since replicated this book, this uh, box project with youth groups and book groups and even a group at the Harvard Business School of all places as part of a talk on perfectionism. It is incredibly effective and I encourage you to try it. The American Psychological Association published a study about toxic perfectionism and reported that the link between perfectionism and suicide is stronger than previously believed and distressingly under-recognized. The feeling of living an inauthentic life, the report says, contributes to a negative self-view, a sense of despair and imposterism. And then there was this quote from the loved one of a man mentioned in the report. Perfectionism plus depression is a loaded gun. Tragically, that quote is not a play on words. The speaker's spouse did end his own life after a battle with depression and toxic perfectionism. This brings home just how dangerous depression can be, how fine the line is that divides clinical depression from suicidal ideation and the next step of attempting to end the pain. So with that in mind, I'd like to say a few words now about suicide. Like many of you, our family has seen the heartbreak. The brilliant father of a little girl in my son's class at school. The son of a dear friend from church. The 20-something son of a work colleague. All died by suicide over the course of just one year. The unthinkable is happening all too often. The numbers speak for themselves and they are distressing a 28% increase in the suicide rate generally in the United States over the last 20 years, a 70% increase since 2010 in the suicide rate nationally among girls. The World Health Organization reports suicide is the second leading cause of death among people ages 15 to 29. Women attempt suicide three times as often as men but men are three times more likely to complete the attempt. Utah ranks fifth in the nation in suicide deaths. The Utah Department of Health reports that one in four teenagers say they've recently seriously considered suicide in Utah, which is a grim statistic given that suicide is already the leading cause of death for young people ages 15 to 24 in this state. Depression is not always the cause of suicide, of course, there are many factors, but it's certainly a contributor. Studies show that depression increases a teenager's risk of attempting suicide dramatically by 12 times. 
Our LGBTQ plus youth are who are rejected by their parents are at special risk for suicide, being eight times more likely than non-rejected youth to attempt it. They also report high le levels of depression at six times the rate of non-rejected youth. When you look at these numbers in Utah and across the United States, it's clear that this is an epidemic. The tragic suicide of a BYU student last month brought renewed attention to the ins insufficient mental health resources on college campuses and wait times at student counseling centers, not just here, but across the country. There is a lot of work to do to be sure with suicide prevention programs that provide tools and information to identify the signs and symptoms of depression, suicidal ideation, and self-injury. So what is most important right now for us to understand in our own sphere of influence? Talking about suicide can actually help prevent it. Every medical professional I spoke with and nearly every book, article, and news story I have read concludes that meaningful progress in suicide prevention starts with eviscerating stigma, talking about it. A nationally recognized expert in his field, Dr. Thomas DeMaria, told me this, we've got to talk about this. Talking about suicide does not prompt people to kill themselves. But for those who are struggling, not talking about it sends the message that they can't talk about it. It's critically important to talk about feelings of depression or other fantasies about suicide which can fester if they're not openly discussed. I'll never forget the teenage girl who fortuitously stopped by my house one freezing January morning a few years ago on her way to jump off a bridge. I'll never forget the conversations on my couch that day before I took her to the hospital to get help. Talking about these feelings, talking about what she was thinking, trying to understand what is so hard and so painful that makes someone feel that they'd rather be dead. I want you to hear now from two women who have lost loved ones to suicide. First, you'll hear from Cynthia. Her teenage son died by suicide two years ago. And then you'll hear from Abby. She was 19 when her 15-year-old brother took his life in 2015. From heartbreaking experience, they both convey the same message, open conversation about depression and suicide with our young people, with anyone, in mental and emotional distress is absolutely critical. Here is Cynthia first. A child that does not have suicidal thoughts, talking about it is not going to make them suddenly think that they ought to go take their lives. But a child that is dealing with suicidal thoughts, talking about it helps deflate the monster. It's like turning on the light and showing the child that there's no monster under the bed. Then they can go to sleep right? And talking about it helps turn the light on, helps deflate the monster, and gives them an avenue to get help. And uh, you don't know what's going on in their head unless you're talking to them. So you have to bring it up. You have to ask the questions. The depression that I saw in Spencer was really, was really clear. And I, I think he was really good at hiding it. And I think that's part of what makes depression scary is that people can be really good at hiding it. Um, and, you know, Spencer seemed fine most of the time, but I know that because of his depression, he was battling so many demons and that was why he ultimately took his life. In order to change the conversation about depression and suicide and, you know, kind of mental illness as a whole, we just need to be willing to talk about it. I think so often we, it's, it's kind of taboo and it's really uncomfortable to talk about. It's difficult to, it's difficult to say, to sit down with someone and say, are you struggling? Do you feel like taking your own life? Do you feel depressed? And those are the questions we need to be asking and we don't. 
And we need to be willing to make that change. I'm so proud of Abby. Uh, she's now pursuing a master's in public health with an emphasis in mental health. That experience completely changed the course of her life. She is passionate and desperate to change the way we communicate about suicide. I wanted to show you this. <clears throat> Cynthia, the first woman that you saw there, was on the cover of the Boston Globe last month. There she is speaking uh, about her experience. It was a comprehensive article about suicide. She did a beautiful job talking about her story and about her son. I first interviewed Cynthia shortly after her son died by suicide two years ago. Since then, in her little area west of Boston, there have been six teenage suicides. One of the other moms quoted in this article talks about how open she has become about this issue in an effort to help others, in an effort to be a resource to others. I'm fighting the stigma surrounding mental illness, she says, one conversation at a time. So is a young man named Seth. He's a suicide survivor. He is married now, beautiful little baby. His openness and honesty about his journey and about his healing is instructive and very helpful. Here's Seth. So my name's Seth Adam Smith. I'm a writer and a blogger. I had struggled with depression all throughout my life. I'd, I never really recognized it for what it was. But around the time I was 20, it, my depression sort of uh, collapsed on me. And uh, I felt like I was drowning. It got so severe that I, I didn't know how to escape it. Um, I would close in on myself. I spent a lot of time alone. I pushed people out of my life. I, I didn't know how to explain what was happening to me. Um, and when you're in that, when you're in the thick of it, it really just feels like uh, you're the only one. Everything just came to a head one day. Um, and I, I looked at my life and I, I realized everything was just broken. I, I couldn't fix anything. I, I, I couldn't control anything. I, I, I just felt like all my life just spun out of control. I went to work. I clocked in for about 40 minutes. My brother Sean was one of my supervisors and left my cell phone there and left the office. Uh, I went home. Um, I decided to take my life. I had thought about it uh, quite a bit. I would have died had my dad not received a phone call from my brother Sean and, and felt like he needed to come and find me. Waking up in the hospital was agony. And then they took me home and I remember my brother Sean uh, put his arm around me and walked me into my room and laid me down on, on my bed. I remember waking up several hours later and Sean was still sitting there on the bed. And I, I thought, maybe he's here because he, he thinks I'm gonna try to take my life again or something. And I said, Sean, I'm all right. I just need to be alone right now. I said, you can, you can go. And he was really quiet. He said, you know, Seth, I almost lost my little brother. So I don't think I'm gonna go anywhere for a while. I'm just gonna sit here with you for a bit. I think that was the first time that I recognized that there was a, a world outside of myself. I started to see that there were people outside of my own life that actually cared about me and that loved me and wanted to see me succeed and live and contribute to their lives. And, and I hadn't been seeing that before. I, I realized he was gonna get all that talking with my parents, with, with therapists, and I realized he probably just needed someone just to hang out with. I took work off for a week and we just sat and watched movies and played games and talked about girls. And if he wanted to talk about it, he could talk about it. My family, they're, they're not doctors. Um, they're not counselors, they're accountants, you know? And, uh, and I'm sure that they felt overwhelmed, you know, like we're not qualified to talk about this. We don't, we don't know what to say and what to do. But the mere fact that they reached out to me in love, that is what did it.
sometimes just sharing the load, being someone to, to sit with you. I mean, my brother Sean hardly said a word, you know? He didn't know what to say, but what he did, what my brother did is what changed my life. Sharing the load, reaching out in love, having someone just sit with you, that's a really important message that anyone who suffers with depression needs to hear. Seth shared with me a line that has since become one of my favorite quotes. Depression thrives in secrecy, but shrinks in empathy. It is not to deny that many of these stories end tragically, but the possibility of healing and hope and compassion and understanding and empathy is always there. And that is my message tonight. So I'd like to share with you what sparked my passion um, on this topic. Over the years, I suffered with what I call situational sadness, just the ups and downs of life, nothing that a good cry or two or three couldn't fix. But a few years ago, I was flattened by a major depressive episode. It was unlike anything I'd ever experienced before or since. I had all the class classic symptoms. I began to isolate myself. All I wanted to do was be alone. I started to shut down emotionally and physically. The cycle of shame and guilt and anger intensified, and as much as I tried, I could not control the negative self-talk in my head. It was insistent and insidious. I started to believe that my children would be better off without me. My husband deserves so much more. I decided it would be better for everyone if I just wasn't around. I started looking for a replacement for myself, a replacement wife for my husband, and a replacement mother for my kids. I even asked a friend if she'd be willing to care for my children if I wasn't around. In my mind, I began planning my funeral, who would speak, what music would be played. I didn't have a plan or a mechanism for making it happen. I just was in a deep depression, and I simply wanted to fall asleep and fade away. As sad and nonsensical as this sounds to me now, at the time, it was completely rational. In my mind, I needed to protect my family from my shortcomings and failures. The insidious fingers of mental illness had wrapped themselves around my mind and squeezed tight. When my husband finally stepped in and physically took me to the doctor, two doctors actually, I very slowly began to move to a better place. It took many months. For a time, I had medication. I did cognitive behavioral therapy where therapists persuaded me that my children and my husband needed me, the real me, not this person whose mind had been hijacked by a terrible illness. Before I got treatment, I felt as though I'd reached the top of a very steep flight of stairs. Another set of stairs was just ahead of me, but totally out of my reach. If I tried to put my foot on that higher step, it was as if all the stairs would collapse, sending me careening down into a dark hole. As the treatment began to work, it was as though another step appeared. I was able to move forward and keep climbing. With each step, the darkness lifted, and so did the numbness. I felt more and more like myself again. Peace was on the horizon. That's when I started to talk about what had happened and realized how many others were suffering, and so often, like me, in silence and my book was born. This experience has given me tremendous compassion and empathy. I can now not help but be hyper aware of the people around me who have that look, the look of hopelessness that comes when you are feeling absolutely nothing, when you would rather just slip away. This experience has also given me sympathy for caregivers I know there are people here tonight who are trying really hard 
to love and support and help a loved one in the middle of a depression, which is excruciating because from the outside looking in, depression looks a lot like selfishness and it can feel a lot like rejection and abandonment. One of the hardest interviews I did for my book was with my husband, Mark. I hadn't fully understood or realized how depression had tapped into some of his deepest emotions, frustration, sadness, anger, fear. I took it personally, he said, like I'd done something wrong or that I'd let you down in some way. I re remember thinking so many times, why is this happening? I just want my wife back. It felt like a separation, like you're now this person that I don't have any connection with and I can't really reach or reason with. In those moments, I felt really scared. Scared I might never get you back. So what would you tell someone, I asked, who's going through this, who's never experienced depression and who's seeing it from the outside looking in? that this too will pass, and that you can't take it personally. You need to be understanding and loving and supportive, but you don't have to be a punching bag either. And that you shouldn't try to fix it yourself. You need to get help. I don't look at your experience, our experience, as a negative for our family. We've definitely grown because of this. From whatever perspective you are viewing this, I truly believe that once you have suffered, you have a particular responsibility to show greater love and empathy for others who suffer as well. A very wise therapist once told me that life isn't really about being happy, it's about finding peace. For me, that peace has truly come through telling my story, our story, and helping others tell theirs. Sure, there is vulnerability, but if you're not vulnerable, you miss out on the connections. As Brene Brown has said, every time you expose your imperfections and someone loves you in spite of or even because of them, you gain trust. You put marbles in the jar. And over time, the intimacy you feel with other people depends on how many marbles are in your jar. Because I have shared my story and listened in return to complete strangers and lifelong friends alike tell me theirs, depression was given a face. Those faces have been imprinted on my heart. They have changed my life. I have a lot of marbles in my jar. The great theologian and author C.S. Lewis once wrote, friendship is born at that moment when one person says to another, what, you too? I thought I was the only one. Tonight, I hope we will all commit to take a big step to forward together to bust the stigma associated with depression and all mental illness. Let's take these conversations from a whisper to a song. Let's share our stories, reach out in love and compassion, be more real, be more authentic, less judgmental, less perfect, Let's make the inside and the outside of our boxes match. I never thought I would say it, but I am really grateful for this journey of depression, for what it has taught me and how it has changed me for good. I'm also especially grateful for the remarkable, brave, resilient, compassionate, and merciful people I have met along the way. There is hope. There is hope. I know it because I have seen it in others and I have lived it myself. Thank you. Thank you for being here and thank you for listening.